I recently read about a middle-aged man who had an affair with a married woman. And in an attempt to cover up his affair, this man proceeded to murder the woman, uh, the woman's husband. Now, the crazy thing is for the longest time, this man got away with this. He got away with adultery, he got away with murder. Until a friend found out and confronted him about it. The good news is that the man was responsive in terms of repentance. He heard the friend's words, he felt convicted and to the heart, and he turned back to the Lord. I read about this man's grievous sin and humble repentance in, you guessed it, the book of Psalm. This is the story of David. Sometimes we think of Bible characters and we think of them as different or higher than us or lofty or we just can't relate in some way. But this is exactly what happened to David as told in the book of 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. The king of Israel had an affair with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And eventually had him murdered on the front lines of battle. David's sin was heinous. But his repentance was wonderful. We often focus on the sins of those in the Bible and forget to celebrate when they repent. And it is God's desire that every single person, even in this room, repents. Repentance from sin brings glory to God and brings us right fellowship with him. And no matter the sin, God calls every single one of us to repentance. But what exactly does true repentance look like? Well, Psalm 51 gives us a blueprint for authentic repentance. Now, I just want you to know about a year ago, I preached from Psalm 51. And I want to preach repentance as often as I can because our habit as believers, if you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, is to fall into sin. Now eventually as we grow in Christ's likeness, we want to overcome that and our habit should be righteousness in following and obeying the commands of the Lord. But we often fall into sin and when we do, we should have the practice of repentance. It should be a part of our daily life. And David here gives us the blueprint for authentic repentance, one that we should refer back to continually, even daily throughout our lives. Now, one commentator, speaking of true biblical repentance, said this. He said, true biblical repentance goes beyond remorse, regret, or feeling bad about one's sin. Now, we can all relate to that, right? Many times when we sin, we automatically have remorse, we have guilt, we feel bad about the sin which we commit. He continues, though, he says this, it involves more than merely turning away from sin. Maybe you've heard that that's what repentance is. It's a turning away from sin, and that is true. He says, in the Old Testament, repentance was demonstrated through rituals such as fasting, wearing sackcloth, sitting in ashes, wailing, and liturgical laments that express strong sorrow for sin. How many of you, the last time you repented, you sat in ashes and you tore your clothes? Hmm. We don't do that anymore, do we? What was happening in the Old Testament times is people were going through these motions, these ritualistic motions. They would tear their clothes as a sign of being sorrowful for their sin. They would sit in ashes. They would do all these rituals, but it had become a routine. And I believe that this has happened even in the Christian church, and it happens in my life too. It's ritualistic remorse. It's the pattern of many in the church today. We bow our head. We flippantly ask for forgiveness of the sin we've committed. We then ask for help in our weakness, and we promise to never do it again. This is the habit of me as a teenager. Lord, I'm so sorry. I'll never do that again. And the next day, I do it again. How many can relate? Amen? And so, in a sense, we have the same pattern that the Old Testament saints had as well. They, they were simply going through the routine. But God wants us to be genuinely repentant When we come to him and asking him for forgiveness of our sin. Psalm 51, David gives us that blueprint. Let's look at it together. Beginning in verse 1. If you're with me this morning, if you're awake, if you're ready to hear from the Lord, say amen. Amen. He says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. 
Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Verse 7, purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my transgressions. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us by way of your spirit and your word. We ask, God, that you would be glorified. We ask that we would be changed. And, Lord, we ask that today that we would repent of our sins. We would turn from our sins and turn to you. And, God, it would be sincere, it would be heartfelt, and you would give us the strength to obey the commands you have called us to obey and to flee from the things you've called us to flee. We give you the praise and the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A few quick things I want us to understand in terms of genuine repentance. Number one, I must acknowledge, this is what David did, I must acknowledge my sin and helplessness. Making it personal, this is what David did. We make it personal when we acknowledge our sin and our helplessness. You will get nowhere in your Christian life. You will grow zero amount in your Christian life if you do not first acknowledge that you have sinned, that you are a sinner, and that in fact you are helpless. That's clearly stated in verses 3 through 9. Specifically in verse 3, David says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He says he's aware of it. He's aware of his sinfulness. He acknowledges his sin to the Lord. What were his sins? Remember, this is the backdrop of his sin with Bathsheba, of adultery, right? You think about all the sins that David committed. What were the sins that David committed? Well, do you just take the Ten Commandments? He did the last five. (laughs) Number six was he committed murder. Seven was he committed adultery. Eight was he basically stole, in essence. Nine, he bore false witness. He lied about things. And ten, he coveted someone else's wife. (laughs) Out of ten commandments, you could even argue the first few about idolatry. This was David's grievous sins. It wasn't just sin. It was sins, plural. And he acknowledges this sin and all of these sins and his helplessness to the Lord. He says that they are, in verse 3, he says they are transgressions. What are transgressions? Well, transgression means to cross the line. When someone tells you, you cannot do this, they are setting up a line, a boundary. And God has set up boundaries in his word. These are the thou shalt nots of the Bible, right? We know that, amen? Everybody shake your head. You know the the shout nots, right? These are transgressions. When we go across that line, when we commit a sin, we are committing a sin against God. We are crossing the boundary that God has set before us. And these are holy boundaries. Have you ever wondered, why does God say these things I shouldn't do and not these things? Well, that's up to God, amen? You see, what we've done as a society is we said, well, we know better than God. We have our own boundaries because we have our own truth. We have our own morality. I am God. I make the rules. And so, therefore, the boundaries are wherever I want them to be. But God says, I have boundaries. They are my holy boundaries. And when we cross those boundaries, we transgress against a holy and righteous God. David acknowledges that. He also, secondly, acknowledges God's righteousness. And I invite you to write these few things down. I must acknowledge my sin and helplessness. There's a few, there's four things under this. I acknowledge, first of all, my transgression. Secondly, I acknowledge my right, or God's righteousness. It's not that I'm righteous, it's that God is righteous. Verse 4 makes it very clear. David says a very strange phrase. If you're listening, say amen. amen. He says against you, speaking to the Lord, 
You only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Where's the emphasis? You. It's on God, right? And so David is showing us the righteousness and the holiness of God in as much as he says this, against you, you only have I sinned. Now, is that true? Is that a true statement? Is, is it only against God that David sinned? No. But he's not lying here. He's simply making a point. David is simply saying that God is so righteous and so holy and so just and so perfect in his being that the greatest sin that he committed was against God. Because God is holy and because God is perfect and because God is righteous, David's greatest sin was against God. It wasn't that David hadn't sinned against Bathsheba. It wasn't that David had, hadn't sinned against Uriah or a host of other people. It was that this sin was against God and that's why it was his greatest offense. Because God alone is holy. God alone is perfect. God alone is righteous. Amen? Amen? Now, now, to wrap our heads around this, you see, we don't really understand God's holiness and righteousness and perfection. We don't understand how, how pure he is and how offenses our sin is against him. But I saw a video the other day of a gentleman. I don't know how long ago this was. I think it was pretty recent. He went to um, where the Mona Lisa was. Y'all see this? And he took, I think it was paint. And he ran up real quick. He snuck in, I think as like an old man or an old lady in a wheelchair. And he snuck paint in and he threw paint on the Mona Lisa. And of course, it's covered, so Mona Lisa's still good. I don't know what that guy was thinking. Maybe it was just a symbol because it's been covered. It's, it's got encased in glass, and so it was protected. But if he had gotten paint on that, that would have been a grievous offense. The Mona Lisa, everybody knows what the Mona Lisa is. Everybody do your best Mona Lisa face. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> do, do I look confused? Now, you take a painting like the Mona Lisa, and you take a piece of artwork like from me, and you put them together, and you go up and you throw paint on both, what's the greater offense? It's against the Mona Lisa, right? The Mona Lisa is the Mona Lisa. Nobody cares about what Dave Pick paints, right? In fact, it's not good at all. <laughs> and so, when we sin against God, we're sinning against the Mona Lisa, and that's even a, that, that's obviously that fails as, a, as an illustration. But it gives you an idea. You see, it's, it's against God that David sinned. And it's against God that we sin. In verse 3 and 4, the word sin and sinned, respectively, means to miss the mark. The first word we talked about was transgression. Here's a line. We cross over that line, that boundary that God has sent. But this word that David uses means to miss the mark. It's, it's the idea of shooting an arrow at a target. God says that when we do this, we miss his mark. What is his mark? His mark is perfection. Sin is more than crossing the line that God has drawn. It's missing the mark that God has set. To sin is to not be perfect, and we're all guilty of that. It's that God has said don't, and we do. That's transgression. And then we do, and God has said do and we don't, right? It's that God has said don't and we do, that's transgression. And God has said do and we don't. We don't do what God tells us to do. How much do we not do? Man, I think we fail to realize how much we don't do that God says actually do. It's easy to be cognizant of, oh man, I crossed the line again today. For the billionth time, I messed up again. I did what God said don't do. But we forget how much God has said, do this, make disciples, share the gospel, live holy, live righteously. All the do's that God has said do, and we don't do. Those are equally sinful in the eyes of God. David acknowledges God's holiness in his righteousness. But he doesn't stop there. In verse 5, he acknowledges his very sin nature. Verse 5, he says, behold, I was brought forth in, what does your Bible say with that word? I was brought forth in, let me hear it. Iniquity. Most of you will probably have the word iniquity. Iniquity means it's that sin nature of David. It's what we know to be total 
depravity. Maybe you've never heard that term. It's a theological term. It means that every fiber of our being is depraved. We have a sin nature going all the way back to Genesis 3, verse 6. This is not on the screen. You probably are familiar. It says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. This is, of course, the story of the fall. When Adam and Eve sinned and ate of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, God drew a line, said, do not cross this line. And they crossed that line and did what God forbade them to do. Romans 5.12 speaks to the consequences of what happens in this instance of the fall. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world... And death through sin, and so death spread to all mankind because all sin. Therefore, just as through one man, who was the one man? Adam. Adam was the one man. Now, we just read that the woman ate first, right? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. What does it say by the man? Just as through one man. It's speaking of Adam. God does not lay the fault of the fall of all civilization, of all creation, on the woman. He lays it on the man. He does this for several reasons. We won't get into them all today. But one of the main reasons is that God established Adam as the head of the household, even in the Garden of Eden. That he was responsible for his family and for his family's decisions. The other reason is that Eve was deceived. The serpent spoke to Eve and deceived her, but Adam took willingly... He didn't have the serpent whispering into his ear and deceiving him. And so God lays the burden and the fault of all of creation on Adam and tells us that we, being descendants of Adam, now have a sin nature too. Because of the fall, every part of us is stained by sin. This goes contrary to what society believes. Society will tell you, you'll hear on the news, you'll hear in TV shows, you'll hear in movies that generally society is good, humankind is good, humans at their very core are good-natured. If we can just get back to that, we'll be okay. This is opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that mankind is sinful at their very core. Our mind, our will... Our emotions and even our flesh, everything is tainted by sin. This is how Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, can say all of our righteous acts, all of our good deeds are as filthy rags. He's saying the good things that we do are stained by sin. It's not just that we cross God's set boundaries, the thou shalt nots. It's not just that we miss the marks, the thou shalts. It's that every fiber of our being is soaked with sin through and through. We are rotten at our very core. That is difficult to hear, isn't it? But it's the truth of the word of God. Because of Adam, we have inherited a sin nature. And if you never sinned on your own will in this life, you still are a sinful creature because of Adam. This is total depravity. You see, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. Did you get that little distinction? We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners by nature. You sin because you have the sin nature in you. No one has to teach a little child to be selfish. Mine is a selfish word. It's a sinful attitude. And you don't have to teach it. In fact, we have to do the opposite. We have to teach children not to be sinners. Because sin comes naturally. Ultimately because we are born into it because of Adam. Charles Spurgeon said this. He says, as the salt flavors every drop in the Atlantic, so does sin affect every atom of our nature. It is so sadly there, so abundantly there, that if you cannot detect it, you are, listen to what he says, you are deceived. Here's what I want you to get from this first point. That David acknowledged his sin before God in all of its variances, right? In all of its complicated ways. Sin is not just one avenue. It's transgressions. It's sinfulness. It's sin nature. It's missing the mark. It's crossing the line. Listen, I want you to understand this morning how steeped we are in sin. It's not just that we are covered in it. It's coming from within us. Amen? Are you getting this point? 
And the first key to repentance, whether it's repentance to salvation or it's repentance from a believer who wants to be made right again with God in relationship, the first key is to be aware, keenly aware of your sinfulness. Every single day, I, 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 just, I just think, Lord, I, I, I am so sinful. Even when I'm not doing the few sins that I just struggle with day in and day out, right? We all have those sins. Raise your hand if you have some habitual sins that you would just like to kick to the curb. Amen? But set those aside. Let's say God frees you from those sins tomorrow. Man, you can pick out five more, can't you? And even beyond that, if you can stop doing those things that you don't want to do and you're doing the things that you do want to do, what about your motive? Every moment of every day, I did something yesterday, building some things here at the church, fixing some things, painting some things, and I'm like, oh, this stinks, and I had a horrible attitude. I was tired, I didn't want to do it. You know what God calls that? Anything that's not in faith is sin. Man, that's a big blanket, amen? That covers a lot of area in my heart. So we are steeped in sin and we are soaked in sin but it's not even that we are soaked from the outside in sin it's that it bubbles up like a spring within us and David acknowledges this nature that he has and if you are truly to have salvation at some point you have to acknowledge it's not just that I sin it's that I'm a sinner by nature and for the believer we come to God knowing that we are just in and through us sinful beings and we acknowledge that and are aware of that before a holy and righteous God. So he acknowledges his transgressions. He acknowledges God's righteousness. He acknowledges his sinful nature. And fourthly, he acknowledges his helplessness. That's the proper conclusion. If you realize who you are in comparison to a holy and righteous God, your natural and right conclusion is, <laughs> what do I do now, right? I can't do anything about it myself. I'm helpless. And in verses 10, you hear, you hear this in David's voice. Listen to what he says. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. God is righteous judge. He is holy. He is perfect. And then in verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. What is David doing here? He's appealing to God. Not himself. He's not going to Barnes & Noble like I used to do as a 16, 17, 18-year-old kid. And I would look in the self-help section. And I'd go and I'd take a self-help book and I'd look in the self-help book and I'd read and I'd read. I'd try to correct myself. I'd try to better myself. Listen, when it comes to genuine repentance, throw all that out. Throw it out. You have to come to God and say, I, I can't. I'm helpless. There is nothing good in me. God, you have to do the work. That's the cry of David's heart. He says to the Lord, you purify me with hyssop. hyssop. You wash me clean. You make me to hear joy. You give me gladness. You let the bones which you have broken rejoice. You hide your face from my sins. Blot out my transgressions. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart. He's asking God to do the change. This is where many of us are failing in our repentance and why you're not getting further in terms of overcoming sin. Because we're not acknowledging I can't. I can't. This is what David does. He acknowledges his helplessness. In Psalm 109, verse 21 and 22, it says this, But you, God, the psalmist says, But you, God, the Lord, deal kindly with me for the sake of your name, because your mercy is good. And then he says this. Are you listening? Say amen. Rescue me. This is the attitude, this is the heart attitude of the believer who is truly repentant. Rescue me. Save me. Verse 22, for I am afflicted, and here's a good word, needy. Man, we use, the only time we use that nowadays is like in a relationship where you're like, you're too needy. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? But God wants you to be needy. 
He, he comes close to those who are needy. You say, I'm weak, I'm broken, I can't do this. I, I'm just failing, I'm about to fall on my face. I can't do it, I've sinned for the thousandth time and I'm sick of it. Listen, you're right where God wants you to be if you will simply say, I can't. God, only you can. You create in me. You, you make me new. You purify me. You cleanse my heart. I need you. God is near to the brokenhearted. He is with those who are contrite in spirit and acknowledge and are aware of their sinful nature and their sinful deeds. You say, I'm weak. You look throughout the scriptures. Christ was always near the weak. That's a good place to be. Verse number 1 and verse number 9, the psalmist continues to ask God to do something for him. Specifically, he uses the words blot out in verse number 1. The very end of verse 1, he says, blot out my transgressions. And then verse 9, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Blot out here is a financial term. It's an accounting term. Don't raise your hand for this. How many of you have ever been in debt? Even just a little bit. It's, it's not a good feeling, is it? You go to bed and you think about that debt. The bigger the debt, the more you think about it. You struggle with it. You get tired of it. Especially if you can't do anything about it. You try to work harder, but for somehow you get more into debt. You see, we were in far greater debt than we could ever have imagined in, re, in regards to our sin nature and the holiness of Christ. The holiness of God. We are in a debt that we cannot Repay. <laughs> the truly repentant are acutely, are you listening to say amen? They're acutely and astutely. Astutely means to be studious, right? You study the word of God and you see. The more you study the word of God, the more you'll see your sinfulness. That's why the older you are as a Christian, if you have been in the word of God and letting the word of God change you from the inside out, the more you'll realize your sinfulness. Can I get an amen? As a pastor, when I was young and I began to be in the ministry, I thought, okay, I'll grow in holiness and I'll, and I'll better myself and I'll become more like Christ and I'll feel better about myself. And in some senses that's true, but in another bigger sense, I realize how wretched I am. How, how, how sinful I am. And the truly repentant, the one that God comes near to is the person says, I'm weak, I'm needy, I'm a sinner. I need God to act on my behalf. The truly repentant are acutely and astutely aware of their sinful behavior and sinful nature. Let me ask you this morning, are you aware of your sin? Are you really aware of your sin? You say, that, that's just going to make me down all day. No, <laughs> no. In fact, for the Christian, when we think that way and we start to remember, man, I am unholy, I am unrighteous, I am unpure, I am a sinner at heart, I can't stop sinning. Even when I want to do good, I don't do good. Even when I don't want to do good, that, that's when I, I do bad. It's like Paul said, right? And we just we beat ourselves up, beat ourselves up, beat ourselves up, but we don't have to stay there, amen? The psalmist didn't stay there either. Because secondly... We apprehend God's mercy in Jesus Christ. This is what we do. Yes, we acknowledge our sin, but secondly, we must take that next step and acknowledge and, and apprehend. That is to take hold of, how many of you are huggers? Raise your hand. You put your arms around Christ and his mercy, and you, you just rely on it. You apprehend it. You take it for yourself. This is what the psalmist did in verse 1. Now, he didn't even realize who he's speaking of, but he's speaking of Christ. If you don't read the Psalms with Christ in mind, you're missing the point of the Psalms. Amen? Verse number one, look at it. Be gracious to me. What's that? Grace. Who is the most gracious one that has ever existed? It's Jesus Christ. Oh God, according to your loving kindness, he is perfect love. He is perfect kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, that is Christ, the compassionate one, because he he went through what we went through, yet without sin. Amen? Blot out my transgressions. He's describing Christ in this first verse. And as believers, we hold on to who Christ is so that we are not overwhelmed by our sin and taken down by it. 
we apprehend or take hold of the mercy of God when we take hold of Christ. Now this is an intellectual but also a heart practice. Every day when you sin, which is every day, and I do too, I run back to Christ. I cling to Christ. Christ is where I find mercy. Christ is where I find forgiveness. Christ is where I find healing. Christ is where I find peace. It's all about Christ. That's why that last song we just heard was so amazing. I love it. It's one of my favorite songs. All I have is Christ. It's nothing of myself. And this is the heart of the truly repentant. David acknowledges that God is just. He's righteous. He's good. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's loving. He's kind. He's compassionate to those who admit that they are weak. 1 John 2, 1 through 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate that is a lawyer. We have a lawyer with the Father. Our lawyer, your lawyer, if you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, is Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the simple way to say that it is, he is the payment for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Your lawyer, Jesus Christ, if you've trusted in him, stepped in in your trial before God the Father. When you were guilty in sin and, and condemned to hell, he stepped in, your lawyer stepped in and said, I'll do the time. I'll take the penalty. I'll make the payment with my life, with my blood. That's what Christ did. Ephesians 1, 7. In him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Folks, this is the gospel. This is what gives you the desire to get back up tomorrow and say, yeah, I sinned yesterday, but I'm striving for righteousness today. Why? Because I want to be better? Because I am better? Because I want to be perfect? No, because Jesus Christ paid for my sin. And I love him because of what he's done for me. And the gospel pushes you forward into righteousness. Not because you have to, but because you're thankful for what Christ has done for you. When we sin, we fall unashamedly on the mercy found only in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Romans 7, 24 and 25, Paul says these famous words. I like, I think that's the King James Version that says, O wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he gives us the answer. But thanks be to God. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is how we're saved from our sin. This is how we have forgiveness in our sin. Through Christ alone. Charles Spurgeon says, for certainly Christ, listen, listen. Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to ruin. Isn't that good? The second Adam, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as the second Adam, is much more powerful to save. He has infinite amount of power to save you. So much more so than Adam has to damn you. A comprehensive understanding of our own sinfulness and God's great forgiveness and mercy found in Christ enables us to truly be repentant. The truly repentant understands this. Now listen, pay attention to this. This will change your Christian walk. If Christ paid for my sin upon the cross with his own blood, if, if, if he blots out my sin, he marks out my debt every time I sin, if he goes through my sin and crosses it off and he paid for that with his own blood, it's not free, he paid for it with his own blood, then as a person who loves the God who saved me, who died on the cross for me, I don't want to charge anymore to that account. I don't want to keep piling on debt. If somebody forgives you a bunch of debt, if you have $2 million in debt, and somebody comes in and says, I'll wipe it clean for you. The rudest thing in the world would be go to that person and be like, you know what, I spent another 100000 Can you cover that too? You know, you go out to someone and we're like, we got this, we'll cover this. And, and they're like, I'll take the lobster and I'll take a steak to go. <laughs> really? We would think that's rude, right? And yet we do that with our Christian life, with Christ. We forget that he has paid our debt. Let's not keep adding to that debt. In essence, what we want to say is because of Christ's sacrifice, my desires have changed. Because of Christ's sacrifice, because he's paid my sin dead and full with his own blood, I now want to love him more than I love my sin. 
I want to love Christ more than I love the sinful desires that I have. And this occurs when we properly understand and comprehend the beauty of Christ's sacrifice against the depth and wretchedness of our own sin. And then when we do sin, which is inevitable, right? You're going to sin. You're going to sin probably later today. You're probably going to sin tomorrow. might not be in the way you expect, but you'll probably sin and I'll probably sin too. When we do that, we cling to Christ. When we sin, we take hold of God's mercy guaranteed by Christ's blood. Listen to me. Are you listening to say amen? When the enemy accuses and condemns, we point to the cross and remind him our sin has been paid in full by the blood of the Lamb of God. We point to the cross, the blood. I remember going to my pastor when I was still in college and telling him of my sins, thinking he was some type of priest or something, like he could do something about it. A man could do nothing for me, but he did do one thing. He said something that changed my life. He said, Dave, stop doing that. It's under the blood. He said, you don't have to feel bad. You don't have to feel guilt-ridden. It's under the blood. The next time Satan accuses you and condemns you, remind him it's under the blood. And the truly repentant take hold of God's mercy in the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? Thirdly, we see the psalmist abhors his sin. And we must do this too. I must abhor my sin. This is a, you know what abhor means. It means hate. I'm sticking with alliteration, all A's, all right? (laughs) We acknowledge that we are sinners. We apprehend that as we take hold of Christ's mercy. And then we abhor our sin. We hate our sin. Verse 4, David says, against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That is a strong word. He's simply saying, I know that my sin is offensive to God. Listen, God hates sin. Our sin, your sin is offensive to God. It's, 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 it's a very, very serious thing. He says, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness. He's talking about murder here. And how heinous it is. We understand that David begins to hate his sin as he loves Jesus more. As he loves God more, he hates his sin more. And that's what will happen in your heart when you are truly repentant. Psalm 119, 128 is on the screen. It says this. Therefore I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. The psalmist is saying... That as believers, as followers of Christ, as people who are children of God, we should hate what God hates. We should hate what God finds offensive. Amen? We should not laugh at at evil and wickedness in our own life or on the screen. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Erdman's Bible Dictionary includes this definition of repentance. It says, in its fullest sense, repentance is a term for a complete change or orientation. And then it says this, involving a judgment upon the past. You are to look at your sin in the past and pronounce a judgment on it. I'm not saying you have to do this literally with your mouth. But you should look at the sin of your past, even if it was yesterday, even if it was two hours ago, even if it was five minutes ago. And you say, that is evil. Even the littlest sins, you say it's just a little lie, it's just a little stealing, it's just a little adultery, it's just a little fornication. It's just listen, no sin is little to a holy God. We see our sin and we recognize it as being evil and something that is offensive to God, and we acknowledge that and we judge it for what it is. See, we develop a healthy hatred for sin when we see its damaging effects. Now, some of you right now are like, well, I don't have any sin in my life. You're in the worst possible state. If that's what you're thinking, you're in the worst possible state of anybody in here. We develop a healthy hatred for sin when we see its damaging effects. What does sin do? Well, first, it hurts the heart of God. Ephesians 4.30 says, and do not... Grieve, that is to make sorrowful. You see, the Holy Spirit is not a force, He is a person. Amen? Amen. And so you can hurt the Holy Spirit. You can hurt the heart 
of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is the one, every part of the Trinity is involved in salvation. The Holy Spirit is the one that seals you, that keeps you. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ and you've trusted in him for salvation, the devil cannot take you out of salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. Don't believe people that say that. Because the Spirit of the living God seals you. And when we sin, we're offending, we're making sorrowful God himself. When we think of sin in this way, sin becomes easy to hate. Amen? I don't want to hurt the one who loved me so much that he gave his life for me. There are many things that I think about doing in terms of sin, and I, I don't do them because I'm like, that will hurt Nikki. That will hurt my wife. I don't want to do that to my wife. I love my wife. I see how my wife, you know why I love my wife? Can I just be honest? Because my wife loves me. <laughs> and it's crazy. It's, I, I'm not, I don't want to laud her to the point that I put her above Christ, but I've never met anybody so, so loving and kind and servant-hearted towards me and everybody else, but mainly towards me. And you know what that does in my heart of heart? It makes me want to love her in response and not sin against her, not do anything that would jeopardize our relationship. Amen? This is the analogy of us in Christ, what God has done. There's no greater love. Her love is great, but it fails in comparison to Jesus Christ and his love for me. Therefore, I do not want to sin against a God who loved me that much. And in fact, it's not that I just don't want to sin. It's that I hate my sin because it takes me away from my Savior who loved me so much. Sin always brings death. Yes, it hurts the heart of God, but secondly, it always brings death. For the believer, not eternal death but spiritual death, right? That's why people can get, a believing believer, God will take out of this life, he will take their life if they continue in unrepentant sin. The Lord says, the Bible says that they, they can be taken from this life. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10 is not on the screen, just listen, it says, Paul says this to the Corinthians, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. Paul gets on to these believers because they're not acting like believers, just to give you some context. He says, for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. In verse 10, for godly grief, listen, are you listening to say amen? amen? For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. This then is the difference between worldly grief and godly grief. There are different types of grief. We're not talking about grief in terms of the loss of someone, not in the loss of a life. We're not talking about that grief. We're talking when the Bible talks about grief here, it's talking about sorrow over sin, okay? And there's a difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. When you sin, there's a difference. You either you either sorrow in in a guilt state or in a godly state. Worldly grief or worldly sorrow focuses, listen, listen, this is important, focuses, worldly sorrow focuses on sin and self. It sounds like this, I can't believe I did that again. I am no good. I can't believe I did that again. I'll never get this right. I'm not worthy of forgiveness. I can't believe I did that again. Worldly grief ends in despair and death. Worldly sorrow looks within and focuses on self. And this never leads to a hating of sin. Rather, it leads to a hatred of self. God doesn't want you to hate yourself. This is what happened. This is the difference between Peter and Judas. Both sinned against Christ, right? Both sinned gravely against Christ. One went out and hung himself. The other repented and was closer to Christ. See, what we as believers often do is we become dead men walking, essentially. We might not go out and hang ourselves like Judas, but we live in a state of self-pity and self-loathing. We say things like, I'm such a sinner, I'll never have victory. Shame and guilt dominate our thinking. And in actuality, what this is, is pride. You say, that, that doesn't sound like pride. It's exactly what it is, because... We're depending on our own righteousness. Remember, God is close to the brokenhearted. He, he comes near to the needy. He wants to be there for the weak. And true repentance weeps and then comes running to Christ. 
not running to self-loathing, self-pity, self-destruction, or death. Godly grief focuses, listen, on the Savior. Godly grief is about God. That's how you know if, if, if you're truly sorrowful for your sin. Am I making it all about me or am I making it about God? That's why Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. But he didn't stop there, did he? He didn't wallow in his sinful state. If he had, it would have led even the great apostle Paul to death. Godly grief acknowledges sin, but quickly shifts its focus onto the one who has forgiven our sin. When you're repenting, when you're asking for forgiveness, when you're on your knees at night or in the morning or whenever you pray, and you come to God for forgiveness and repent to God, make sure that you're focusing on God. Make sure that you acknowledge your sin, you cling to Christ, and then you make it about Jesus. See, we abhor or hate our sin when we recognize that it hurts the heart of the one who saved us and it leads to spiritual death if we continue in it. And so the proper response is not a hatred of oneself, but a hatred of sin and a looking to the Savior. Lastly, number four, I must alter my focus of worship. I must alter my focus of worship. So we acknowledge our sin before a holy God. We make sure that we apprehend the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. We begin to abhor and hate our sin as we see it for what it is. And then lastly, we, we have to turn our, our attention to worshiping Christ, to worshiping God. Psalm 51, 13 through 17, listen to what happens to the psalmist. He says, Lord, restore me. He says, forgive me, cleanse me, create in me a clean heart, wash me, purify me. Right? He's saying to God, God, you do the work, and then look what his part is. Look at verse 13. Are you with me? Say amen. He says, then, when God has forgiven, cleansed, purified, washed me, all these things, when you make me right, God, then, here's what I'm going to do. I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness, O Lord. Open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise, for you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Out of a clean heart comes clean worship. If you want to know if you're really sorrowful, if you want to know if you're really repentant, what are you saying, what are you singing, and listen, here's the big one, what are you doing? Are your actions different? Not just, no, I'm not going to do that anymore, but when you begin to, listen, when you begin to worship Christ with your mouth and with your life, then things begin to change practically in what you do. It's not just, I'm not going to do the do nots anymore, I'm going to begin to do what Christ has called me to actually do. It's worship. It's life worship. Real repentance is a renewed focus of worship. You see, everybody worships something, right? Right? Everybody worships something or someone. This is what happened to Paul in Acts 9, 21 and 22. It says, all those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? They're saying, isn't this Saul the one that persecutes the Christians? Verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus how? By proving that Jesus is the Messiah. His words and his actions changed as he began to worship Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2.22 says this, So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who are called on the Lord from a pure heart. We turn away from sin, yes. But the way we stay away from sin, are you listening to say amen? Is by worshiping Christ. We don't worship our sin anymore, we worship Christ. It's as simple as this, and I invite you to write this down. You become what you focus on. How many of you have heard that before? It's not new by me. You become what you focus on. That's why you hear some people say, I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to be like my mom. I don't want to be like so-and-so, right? We've all said that. But have you noticed that when you say that, when you begin to dwell on that person, you begin to become like that person? Be certain not to focus on your sin. 
instead focus on Christ. When we focus on Christ, we become like Christ. Listen, we become what or who we worship. We become what we worship. So focus on Christ. It's as simple as that. The question when it comes to genuine repentance is have you changed your focus of worship? True repentance actively pursues Christ. And in the pursuit of Christ, we develop Christ's likeness. 1 Peter 1.16, the Lord commands us to be holy because he is holy. You don't obey this command by focusing on not being sinful. You become holy when you focus on worshiping the one who is holy. We become what we worship and we truly repent, become truly repent when we focus on worshiping the Savior rather than our sin. This is what the psalmist did. This is our, what we are to do as believers. And as Christians, it's imperative that we sit here this morning and we comprehend and we understand there is sin in my life. Right now, there is sin in my life that I can repent of. There's something in your heart of hearts. You say, I, I can't think of anything. In fact, I asked forgiveness for all my sins when I came to church this morning. And even when we were worshiping, I prayed. But are you doing what God has called you to do? Are you making disciples? Are you sharing the gospel? Are you in the word? Are you, are you worshiping with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? In Joel 2, 12 through 13, the Lord says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart or tear your heart, not just your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. He is waiting for you to return to him. He will welcome you with open arms. He is near to the weak, but he calls us to repent. This must be practiced daily. In closing, I want to give you three practical things. You can write these down. You can put them by your bedside. You can put them on a mirror. And I encourage you to do these things daily. Number one, acknowledge my sin. That's obviously point number one. And even right now, I want you to write down somewhere, maybe in your notes, in your bulletin, write down two sins that you have in your life. One that you do not want to do, a sin of commission that you're committing against God, and one that's a sin of omission, one that you're not doing that God wants you to do, right? So a sin of commission would be, I, I'm stealing right now, and I, I'm, I'm going to stop stealing. I'm going to turn and worship Christ. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to condemn that. I'm going to judge that sin. So one sin that you're doing that you want to stop, but then one sin that you're committing that, that you're, you're, you're omitting, right? That you're not doing what God has called you to do. Maybe that's giving to the Lord. Maybe that's being consistent at church and part of a body of believers. Maybe that's, like we mentioned earlier, maybe it's something along the lines of, I don't know, whatever God is talking to you about. This is a very personal thing, right? You don't have to show it to anybody else. Maybe you're not witnessing. Maybe you're not living the life Christ has called you to live. Acknowledge my sin. Secondly, cling to Christ. And third, turn my focus of worship. This is how we act in terms of repentance. Practice these things every day and watch your relationship with God grow and grow and grow. Watch you become who God has called you to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. To those of you who do not know Christ, do you know that Jesus' mission was and still is to call sinners to repentance? Luke 5.32, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's calling you. Will you turn in repentance to him today? Lord, we thank you for our...